Hey everyone, today we'll be taking a look at the ancient Mesoamerican ball game played by the Olmec, the Maya, the Aztecs, and even some indigenous people today in the form of a llama. So I was first captivated by this sport thanks to the animated film The Road to El Dorado, which is near and dear to my heart but actually seems to have slipped under the radar for a lot of people, so I definitely recommend it. But basically what happens is that you have these two stowaways, Miguel and Tulio, who find themselves in a new world with a map to, well, El Dorado, the city of gold. When they arrive there, they're going to be greeted as gods, and they're going to be invited to play ball in the grand court of the city before the king and his people. Obviously, they're trying to keep up the charade, the ruse here, but they find themselves at an impasse and have no idea how to play this game. The scene unfolds as Miguel and Tulio struggle to compete against 15 professional players who have little problem using their hips, thighs, and elbows to score points in this impossibly high hoop. After some coaching, you know, the hip, the hip, and a healthy dose of cheating, the heroes manage to win and begin to celebrate. But the scene does take a dark turn when the heroes find out that the losing team, the team they just cheated to beat, is actually going to be sacrificed. So this scene has been seared into my memory, and obviously the ending there with the sacrifice is something that we all loosely associate with the Mesoamericans and the Aztecs in particular. But I figured, you know, this is an animated film, it's about time that we dig into the history, so that's what we're going to be doing today. Let's start first with our sources of evidence. How do we know what we know? Well, the most obvious line of evidence is going to be the ball courts themselves. We have over 1,000 archaeological remains which are spread out across Mesoamerica with different densities. And some of our earliest ones are found in Paso de la Amada, which date all the way back to the 1600s BC, so these are definitely very prevalent in this culture. We even have some preserved rubber balls, which I believe were dredged out of swamps. So that's all pretty cool. We have the ball and the ball court. But still, put those two together and it leaves a lot to the imagination for how this game was played. So let's turn to our second line of evidence. And this is actually going to be written records which give us some context. These come in the form of some writing from Mesoamericans themselves, either from you know sculpted reliefs or codices, as well as writings from the Spanish chroniclers in the 16th century. While all this information is definitely enlightening, I still have to note that there's much we don't know. But with that being said, let's go ahead and talk about what the historians have been able to piece together when it comes to the ball court, the rules, the players, the crowds, the societal function, and yes, the sacrifice associated with it. The ball court. So these ancient playing fields come in many shapes and sizes, but typically take the form of an eye. In the middle of the eye, you have the central alley, which is going to be flanked by two walls on either side, either sloped or vertical. And then on each of these sides, you're going to have mounted these stone hoops, which are often highly decorated. But it's important to note that you don't always have these hoops present. And then at either end of the court, the end of the eye, you have these sort of end zones, which might actually be open or backed by a wall or even a temple. And since this was a spectator sport, there would also be surrounding stands for crowds to gather and watch. Additionally, markers might be built into the court for either practical or symbolic reasons. The rules. The game was actually played between two teams, with each team having around 5 to 8 players. These teams then faced off and competed to score points with a rubber ball. Points could be scored in a variety of ways depending on the version of the game, and it seems to have varied by location and time period because all my references were talking about a whole bunch of different rules, and I'm not sure if they were all you know, in place at once or if these represented different versions. But in any case, let's go over some of the basic rules. So in terms of scoring points, you could score a point when an opponent failed to return the ball or knock the ball out of bounds. You could score points if the ball was launched into the opposing team's end zone or when special markers were hit. And you could also score points when you pass the ball through one of those two flanking hoops. The flanking hoops were actually very, very special in that it was very hard to get the ball through there. And if you did it, it ended the game instantaneously. So that functions a bit like the snitch in Quidditch. Although we'll have some Harry Potter experts in here who are going to make the argument that, yeah, the snitch doesn't automatically win you the game. But I mean, come on, it gives you 150 points and it's hard to come back from a deficit like that. So the analogy stands. In any case, those are going to be the main ways you could score points. Another important thing as well is going to be how you could handle this ball to get those points. Well, again, rules do seem to vary, but the main one seems to say that across all these games, you couldn't use your hands or your feet. So in various games, you would see players actually rely on their hips, their thighs, their knees, sometimes their elbows, and even their heads. And you get a penalty for breaking these rules. So we've covered rules which dictate how you can interact with the ball, but then there's other rules as well which dictate the end of the play, and these are both going to be tied to the ball itself. So one version is going to be a bit like volleyball, the other one's more like tennis. In the volleyball variant, essentially the play ends when the ball hits the ground on one side. 
So the goal here is while it's on your side, you got to keep it up in the air and toss it over to the opponent's side. And Diego Duran, this ancient friar, actually claims that skilled players back in the day were able to keep the ball up in the air for up to an hour at a time. So that's insane. The other version of the game, essentially the play ends when the ball comes to a stop on one team's side. So in that version, things are, you know, the space between players, I would presume, are a little bit wider. And my theory about this is that the two versions would probably have their own separate ball courts. Because if you look, for instance, at the ball court of Chichen Itza, there's no way you're going to be able to keep the ball up in the air on such a huge court. So my theory about, you know, ball courts like Chichen Itza is that's probably the variant of the game where the ball just can't stop moving on your side. So those are the two versions, but again, I'm not quite sure, you know, where and when these rules were played, how they superimposed with the previous rules that we talked about. So it's all a bit of a, uh, a mystery still, but I hope this has been somewhat elucidating. So as for the players, well, as we've seen, the game seems to have been pretty popular and thus was most likely played by large portions of the population, probably in informal courts, although the aristocracy were probably the ones playing on these official ball courts that we still see today, and they would have been doing so for both recreation and sport. And these nobles were sometimes joined by non-noble professional players, who actually made a living off of prizes or were sponsored by the royalty. And when these players took the field, they would typically wear loincloths or short skirts, and for protection they would don leather, wood, or woven padding and even often gloves, since they'd be running around, slamming into the ground, hitting this heavy rubber ball, hitting the walls actually as well. But from what I've been able to tell, I'm not quite sure if they were actually hitting each other. I don't believe that there was much contact between the players. I think it's mostly contact with the ground, uh, although I could be mistaken. Another thing that you might also see is that due to the ceremonial nature of the games, their uniforms might actually include some elaborate headdresses or other apparel, which could actually be donned during play or after the end of play. So now for the last part of the video, we're going to expand our scope to talk about the world which formed around the sport itself. So let's start first with the crowds. So as we've mentioned, this is definitely a spectator sport, and it's likely that this was a game that drew the attention of the rich and the poor alike. Although, from what we can tell, the ball courts themselves never really reached the size of grand stadiums to accommodate the masses. Rather, it appears that these great ball courts were attended by largely nobles and elite classes. These individuals were greatly invested in the outcome of the matches, as gambling was extremely widespread. According to one of the chroniclers that I found, he says that these nobles were known to bet jewels, slaves, precious stones, fine mantles, the trappings of war, and women's finery, as well as even mistresses. In some other stories, I actually found references to kings who were wagering away parts of their territory, such as marketplaces or royal gardens, just on the outcome of these games. In a broader sense, these games were actually very important to society, as is evidenced by the appearance of ball courts in most of the major cities. They were often located in or around the sacred precincts and were flanked by temples which closely tie them to important political and religious functions. The ball courts themselves not only hosted ball games, but also doubled as locations for festivals, feasts, and ceremonies. Any such gathering points were definitely very important and served to form a bridge between the different levels of society but perhaps the religious ties are going to be some of the most important underlying factors. And this is going to be made clear by the religious iconography adorning the ball courts, as well as the appearance of the ball games themselves in the specific religious texts and images. Apparently, the ball represented the sun, which was passed between each side of the court, which symbolized the heavens and the underworld. This solar cycle was actually of huge significance to the Mesoamerican religion and tied closely to the cycles of death and rebirth. As such, the equinoxes were very important dates and it appears that the ball games were scheduled to mark the battle between celestial and infernal forces on these events. This brings us to our final discussion of sacrifice. The Mesoamericans, and the Aztecs in particular, believed that the machinery of the world was driven by vital energy held in blood. Religious ceremonies were often tied up to offering such nourishment to drive the machinery of the world. It appears that the ball games held on these important religious dates were thus also associated with sacrifice and the battle between the celestial and infernal forces. This seems to be confirmed by the murals at Chichen Itza, which show a ball player representing the sun being sacrificed on the vernal equinox and a player representing the moon being sacrificed on the autumnal equinox. However, it's unclear to what degree this was actual practice or merely symbolic, but given the track record of the Aztecs, I would tend towards it being real. Yet even with this assumption, we're left with many questions as to how the victims were chosen. Some historians actually believe that the losing team was killed entirely, or perhaps just the leader or the coach, whereas others actually posit that it was the winners who were the ones to be killed. 
There's a ton more we could speculate on, but as far as I can tell, this is where the limits of our knowledge reach. And with that, I'm going to conclude by saying that I find this topic insanely interesting and can't wait to cover more Mesoamerican history, which seems to actually go untouched in most classes. I hope you enjoyed this, and please let me know if there are any other things you'd like to hear more about. And also, please consider tossing a dollar or two our way on Patreon, as it helps fund the research, writing, and art, which power the channel. Thanks again, everyone.